right, so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit more about colon space. Uh, I did watch the video of last week's review, so I know you guys touched on it a little bit. I just wanted to go a little bit more into it, and then I'll talk about the null space after that. Okay? So first, uh, we're going to talk about the column space again. Okay, so remember that the column space of a matrix A, so we often denote it just as like C of A for the column space of A. And this is defined to be the span of the uh, columns of the matrix A, okay? <coughs> uh, do you guys remember what span meant? All linear combinations. Yeah, that's right. So it's all linear combinations of the columns of A. Now, uh, there was another way of viewing the column space which you guys uh, talked about last time. So when you do matrix vector multiplication, all right, like A times X, so remember how that forms like a linear combination of the columns of A? All right, are you guys familiar with that? You remember how that works? Good. <coughs> so therefore, another way of uh, defining the column space is you can define it to be uh, the set of all vectors as a form. Oh, okay. All vectors of the form a x, where x could be uh, any vector. Let's say if a is size uh, m by n x would have to be size n by 1, so it would be a vector in Rn. So it's all vectors of the form Ax. Since Ax is just a linear combination of the columns of A, and the column space is all linear combinations of the columns of A. I'm going to rewrite this one more time, though, just because like, rewording it slightly differently uh, might be more like revealing, if you will. So the other way you can think of the column space, you can say the column space of A is a set of all, let's just write it in words, a set of all vectors uh, B, uh, for which uh, the equation AX equals B has a solution. Okay. So that's another way of thinking of the column space. So uh, you know, again, just uh, rephrasing things. So you can say that a vector B is in the column space of A if and only if this equation has a solution. Okay. And we are going to be, that fact is very important. Uh, and we're definitely going to be using it uh, multiple times later in the semester. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to maybe do like um, small examples. <coughs> okay, so let's just consider the following uh, set of questions. So I'm going to ask, uh, is the vector <coughs> B, which I'm going to define to be the vector 3, 4, and 3, so is this vector B a linear combination of the vectors uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 2, negative 1, 2? So let's think about this question for the moment. Okay, so before I go about solving the question, uh, I want to just show you guys some different ways that the same question can be worded, all right? 
So another way to word the exact same question is to ask, uh, is this vector uh, in the span of the vectors 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 2, negative 1, 2. So it's worded differently, but it's the exact same question, right? <coughs> and uh, again, I can continue rewriting this question using different words, but meaning the exact same thing. So I could also ask, is this vector B in the column space of the following matrix? Uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, negative 1, 2. Okay. So again, that's the same question, right? For B to be <coughs> in the column space means that B was uh, in the span of the columns. So that's the same as the previous question. Okay. And then again, I can also ask, is this vector B? Or let's write it like this. Another way to ask the same question is, uh, does there exist a solution uh, to the equation ax equals b, where a is the same matrix that we have uh, from the previous part? And B is the same vector that we've been using uh, all this time. Okay. So I just want you guys to really be able to see how uh, how all these things are related to each other. All these questions they might look different, different words, but they're all literally the exact same question. You can literally answer all of them doing the exact same thing. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? All right. <coughs> So let's see, if I wanted to actually go about answering uh, these questions, uh, well, let's just look at the last question. I seem to check, is there a solution to this equation? So let's do that. Uh, how do we go about solving an equation of the form ax equals b? Well, that's something that you've been doing the entire semester. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set up my augmented matrix representing the uh, system of equations. So AX equals B. And uh, I made my matrix pretty simple. So normally you want to do some elimination here. If I just do row 3 minus row 1, Uh, that would eliminate that one, giving me a zero. And then we'll have zero minus zero, two minus two, okay. uh, three minus three. <coughs> okay. So when we reduce the matrix, we end up with this. <coughs> and we've kind of reduced it to that upper triangular form. So what would your next step be? if you got to this point. So first, can you answer the question, does there exist a solution to AX equals B? Yes, all right. Um, and what's the reason for why we have a solution, just from what we have here? So the bottom row is zero equals zero, so there should be infinite many solutions. Yeah, in this case, you actually have infinitely many solutions. So remember to have no solution, you should have something like 0 equals 1, or 0 equals something non-zero. So since we don't have that, we don't have no solution. So we have um, at least one solution, OK? So on this one, are we not, we're just stopping here. We're not going to take anything further? Yeah. So actually, the way that I phrased that question, I guess that's all you really need to check, all right? 
So I guess um, for the answer to all the above questions, the answer would actually be yes right now. Okay. <clears throat> now, yes, uh-huh. So uh, like if it was on the bottom, mm -hmm. like one equals one or something like that, would we like have to solve it and find out? You could, well, mm, <coughs> so yeah, um, I guess if he had that, you would have a solution and you could actually work out to see what the solution is. Okay. Uh, the way that I phrased the first four questions, though, is was just asking, is there a solution? But didn't necessarily require you to actually find the solution. Okay. Uh, but let's say, just uh, might as well, let's go ahead and find what the solution is, all right? So let's just say that continuing from what we have so far in this example, uh, so we just verified that the answer to all the above questions is yes. So in particular, you can say that B is a linear combination of these three vectors. Let's say, continuing from this, <coughs> let's say we now want to express B as a linear combination of these three vectors. Okay. So we just verified that it's possible. Now we want to actually write it as a linear combination. So if I wanted to do this, uh, what should I do? <coughs> well, solve from one of the variables. Yeah, basically it, right? Just continue solving. Uh, get the actual solution, right? <laughs> So looking at the uh, reduced matrix that we have, I'm going to write out the corresponding system of equations, 1x1 plus 0x2 plus 2x3 is 3. And then we have uh, 1x2 minus x3 is 4. OK? And what would I do here if I wanted to find the solution? Mm -hmm. Set the second equation equal to x3 and then backwards substitute it into the first equation. Mm, okay, yeah. So, yeah, you can do that, um, but let me do something slightly different. So, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's sort of a convention which I think is uh, often good to follow. So, what's happening is you do have a free variable, okay? So, are you guys familiar with what a free variable is? Okay. So usually we choose the variable that was missing a pivot to be the free variable. Okay. You don't have to do it that way all the time, but uh, that will always work. Okay. And sometimes it's good to do that. So I'm going to follow that convention. I'm going to uh, choose x3 to be the free variable. And then the way that I usually do it is for my free variables, I assign to them a parameter. So I'm going to just let x3 be equal to t. And then what I would need to do here is solve for x2 and x1 uh, in terms of my free variable, in terms of my parameter. Okay. So for instance, x2 would be 4 plus t, okay. <coughs> whereas x1 would be 3 minus 2t. OK? So then this would represent the set of all the solutions to our equation, uh, t being uh, any real number. Uh, but to actually answer the question, though, which was to express v as a linear combination, uh, how do I do that? You guys know? Okay, so <coughs> did you want to say something? Well, you would just, yeah. um, would you, mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, remember how that when you do matrix structure multiplication, the components of the vector form the coefficients uh, of the linear combination uh, of the columns of A. Okay. So the idea is like um, each solution will give you a, a set of coefficients <coughs> that you can use to express B as a linear combination, all right? So all I really need to do is just pick one of these infinitely many solutions, okay? So just pick one solution. Uh, I'm just gonna plug in T equals zero. That gives me X1 is three, X2 is four, X3 is zero. Okay. <coughs> so then I should be able to use these three numbers and I should be able to express B as three times the first vector, which is a one, zero, one, plus four times the second vector, which is zero, one, zero. And that should be able to be plus zero times the uh, third vector, which was two, negative one, and two. And remember that B itself was a vector 343. Three. So you can check that uh, everything adds up, all right? And so if you picked any other solution, uh, that also would have worked as well. So there's more than one way to uh, do this part, okay? All right, good. Any questions about that? Okay, uh, so what I really wanted to emphasize is really just how they can work the same uh, question in many different ways. So you have to understand the terminology, the definitions, uh, in order to be able to interpret the questions that they're asking, and then that way you kind of know how to go about solving it, all right? So if there are no questions, then I'm going to start talking about the null space next, yes. Um, on the homework set for this week, there's a question mm -hmm. about comparing column spaces of different matrices. Mm, yes. How uh -huh. we determine if the column space of different matrices are the same? Mm, okay. So let's talk about that first, all right? So when do two matrices have the same column space? Okay. So first off, uh, a lot of the sometimes you can just kind of tell by inspection, right? So if I just make up an example real quickly. Well, I can actually just, uh, so let me do one that I had earlier. I think it was something like this. And let's do B, which is uh, <clears throat> one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and that's it. <clears throat> okay. So like uh, in this case, the span of B, or sorry, the column space of B would be the span of the two columns, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Okay. Now, if we look at the column space of A, so it should be the span of the three column vectors, the one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and finally the extra two, negative one, and two. Wait, I thought the column uh -huh. space deal with, column space doesn't deal with the number of pivots? You're thinking about finding a basis maybe, or the dimension of the column space, which I think we'll probably save for next time, because it sounded like not everyone has gotten to that point yet in class, all right? But no, the column space itself though is the span of the column vectors in the matrix, okay? 
Now, uh, if you notice, however, that the third column is actually a combination of the first two. Okay. So in other words, this third <coughs> column doesn't contribute anything new to the span. It's already a combination of the first two. So in that case, you can say, oh, well, it's just you know, span of uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So you can kind of see it's the same thing, right? But sometimes, uh, just kind of by inspection, sometimes you can tell, all right? Uh, if I add another sort of relatively easy to do example, let's say if I would make another matrix C, which I'm going to say is at 2, 0, 2. And then like a zero three zero. Okay. Uh, oh well, okay. So I guess it's column space of C. It's kind of funny. Uh, but in this case, column space of C would be the span of node two zero two and zero three zero. But you can kind of see how. Uh, these vectors are just kind of like multiples of each other, right? So in that sense, uh, they're basically going to span like the same plane in R3. So therefore, you can also kind of say, well, these are going to be the same. So column space of A and column space of C would also be the same. Okay? <coughs> but if I were to give you like just a completely general way of telling when any two matrices have the same column space, uh, let's see here. Yeah, especially if the numbers like are not so easy to see, right? Okay. I think here's what I would recommend. So, let's see here. Let me close the door real quickly because it's getting a little bit loud. So I think uh, this is what I would recommend. I would take, so to determine first if column space of A is the same as column space of B. I think here's what I would do. So first, I would take the matrix A and I would augment it with the matrix B, okay? And then I would do, uh, I would do row operations, okay? Try to uh, just reduce A to like sort of the like upper triangular row echelon form, okay? And what I would be looking for is so maybe two possibilities. So if you get a row of zeros from A, and then if at least one being on the other side is non-zero in the same row, OK, something non-zero. That would mean that uh, they have different column space. Is that for like we have any row that has <coughs> zeros across for A? In yeah, and as long as the corresponding row on the right hand side has uh, <coughs> at least one non zero entry, that would imply that at least one of the columns of B was not a combination of the columns of A. And that's why they would have a different column space. Okay. So I'm thinking of like um, to check if something is a column space. If I zoom out real quickly. <coughs> so we saw in the previous example, to check if B is in the column space of A, I just need to see is there a solution to this. So essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm checking if every single column of B 
is a combination of A, of columns of A. So if you get zero and then something non-zero, that meant one of those equations had no solution. That's why uh, they had different column space. Now, if, if this does not happen, right? then what that would mean is that the column space of A, it would contain the column space of B. So every column of B was a combination of the columns of A. But technically, that doesn't mean that they had the same column space. Because it could be that like a column space of A was bigger, perhaps, than a column space of B. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, if this does not happen, then what you would need to do next is, let's see here. I think what the easiest thing you could do at this point would be to take B by itself. And just row reduce B. and look for how many pivots uh, this matrix B will have, all right? And if, if the number of pivots in A equals the number of pivots in B, Uh, so we'll talk, you'll probably talk about it next time, but the number of pivots tells you the dimension of the column space. So if they have the same number of pivots, then the column spaces have the same dimension. So if you verify that column space of A contains column space of B, and then verify they have the same dimension, that would imply that the two column spaces were the same. Okay. Yeah, so first, just do this augmented matrix thing. Row reduce. <coughs> if this happens, they are not the same. Otherwise, then row reduce B. And if they have the same number of pivots, they are the same. Uh, if they don't have the same number of pivots, they are not the same. Actually, you probably could have started the other way first. That's OK. So this is one way to check if two matrices are the same column space, I would say. All right. Uh, maybe I can just try uh, doing one <coughs> example as well. So let's create a matrix A. Uh, let's try to keep it somewhat easy. Zero. Let's do uh, one, negative one, three. Mm. Then I'm going to create another matrix B. <coughs> Let's do uh, mm. Wait, I have a question. Yes. Is, uh -huh. You said if the number of pivots in A equals the number of pivots in B, then the column space mm. of A equals the column space of B. Yeah, as a continuation of um, this, though. Okay. So not like a, just that by itself would work, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then uh, after doing the first part, if you don't get this happening, rows, zeros, and A, and then something non-zero and B, then row reduce B, and then if the number of codes are the same, they have the same column space, all right? So let's try to set up an example. Okay, so it's kind of made one up. 
So let's try to illustrate the algorithm that I just <coughs> mentioned. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is you know, take A and augment it with B. So first is colon space of A, same as colon space of B. Okay, so I'm going to take A, augment it with B. And then we're going to row reduce A. Okay. Well, row reduce the whole thing. So I do like row two minus two or row one. All right. So if we do that and say negative one minus two is negative three. 7 minus 4 is positive 3, and then 14 minus 8 is positive 6. Okay? So if I do like, you know, one more operation, like row 3 plus row 2, I do get a row of zeros, but I also get zeros on the other side. So I did get a row of zeros, but since I have zeros on the other side, what that means right now is that the column space of A will contain the column space of B. Every column of B was a combination of the columns of A. So now what I need to do is check. I'm going to take the matrix B. So my next step now is take B and row reduce it. That's my next step now. So if I had 0, 0, and then something non-zero over here, then I immediately could have said the column spaces were different and stopped. But since I have 0 and 0 on both sides, now I'm going to take B and row reduce B. So uh, oh gosh, let's see here. What is, mm -hmm. what is that say um, next to the, <coughs> on the, the second to the last row at the end? It says column space of A is. Yeah, this symbol means uh, contains. Contain. Yeah. The column space of A contains the column space of B. All right? Mm -hmm. All right, good question. Okay, so now we're reducing this guy over here. I am going to uh, add row 3 to row 2 first. Because I wanted to get, like uh, in this case, negative 1 as a pivot to make my life easier. Okay. And then what I can do is say like row 2 plus 7 of row 1. <coughs> Do like row three uh, minus three of row one, okay? If you do that, you should find that you do get all zeros in the second and third row, okay? okay so then let's take a look. So B. B yields a total of one pivot, right? Now for A, now we did reduce A earlier up top, and we saw that A gave us two pivots. Okay. So that tells us that column space of A has a bigger dimension than the column space of B, so they must be different, okay? So because these are different from each other, I can conclude that the column space of A is strictly larger, in particular not the same as the column space of B. <coughs> okay? 
So that would be like a super general way of doing the problem. Uh, now I think most of the problems, if we think about the one in your homework assignment, most of them can kind of tell by inspection. Uh, and maybe if you're not sure about the numbers, this would be like one like clear way to establish the answer. Yes? Did you do um, mm. uh -huh. row one plus row three? Oh, yes I did, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I did row one plus row three here. Whoops. Yeah, thank you. And I did that just because having a negative one as my pivot was easier to do the elimination, all right? Okay, any questions about that? All right, cool. All right, so in that case, uh, I am going to talk about the null space of a matrix, all right? Okay, so first let's uh, look look at what the definition of the null space is. All right. So the null space of A, which we notate just by like n of A. Okay. So by definition, it is the uh, set of all solutions. to the uh, homogeneous uh, equation. Okay. And have you guys heard this phrase, homogeneous equation? So what does that refer to? Yeah. yeah. The homogeneous equation is the equation ax equals uh, zero, okay? So specifically, zero on the right-hand side. All right, so the first thing I want to remark uh, for any matrix A, so let's, let me be a bit more clear. So let's say it's an M by N matrix A, all right? So for any M by N matrix A, the null space of A is, in fact, a subspace, as the name kind of suggests, all right? So it is a subspace of, let's see here, if A is N by N, uh, it would be a subspace of uh, R N in particular, okay? So let's just uh, understand why that's true. So first, regarding being a subspace of R n, okay? So the null space is all the solutions to this equation. As you can see, if A is size m by n, any solution x would have to be a vector in R n. <coughs> hence, the subspace would, hence, it would in particular be a subspace of R n, okay? Now, I just wanted to also uh, very quickly check uh, the two closure properties that you need for something to be a subspace. So remember, to have a subspace, your set has to be closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. Uh, it's not hard, so let's just check that real quickly, okay? So how does uh, closure under addition work? Anyone? Okay. So for closure under addition, uh, what I want to do is I want to take 
uh, two vectors. Uh, I'll call them x1 and x2. So I have two vectors in the null space. To be closed under addition means that the sum should also be in the null space. Okay? All right. Now, if I have two vectors that are in the null space, so first, uh, what does that mean? Well, to be in the null space means that each of them satisfy the uh, homogeneous equation. So I have two factors, x1 and x2. And they satisfy these two equations, all right? So what I want to do now is check if their sum is also in the null space. Now again, what does it mean to be in the null space? It means that it's a solution to the homogeneous equation. So for the sum to be in the null space, A times the sum should be equal to zero. Okay. So let's uh, actually check over here. If I do a times x1 plus x2. So why are we yes. why are we checking for closure under addition? Well, I want to show that the null space is actually a subspace. Because just oh. because we call it a space doesn't necessarily mean it is a space, right? So I want to sort of justify the terminology basically, right? Yeah, so I'm checking right now that the null space of a matrix is a subspace by showing that it is closed under addition and then closed under scalar multiplication, all right? <clears throat> so here I'm checking if the sum is in the null space, so I have A times <coughs> the sum. So what can we do? Well, I can distribute A to each term, so that's just AX1 plus AX2. Uh, but then remember that x1 and x2 themselves were in the null space. So ax1 is 0, and ax2 is also 0. So that's 0 because of this. <coughs> and so what do we get? a times the sum is equal to 0. And so therefore, the sum is in the null space of a. That's just for addition, right? So what this shows, is, yeah, what this shows is that the null space of a matrix is closed under addition. All right. So then uh, let's also just check closure under scalar multiplication as well. All right. Do you guys remember how this works? Some scalar that's kind of real numbers multiplied by some yeah. Yes, okay. So, what I need to do to show that it's closed under scalar multiplication, I'm going to pick a vector in the null space. Uh, so, again, um, to be in a null space means that it satisfies this equation. What I want to do is Take that vector and multiply it by a scalar. And I want to check if this result, if this uh, scalar multiple is in the null space. And to say that it's in the null space, so again, that means that that vector should satisfy the homogeneous equation. So it should satisfy that property. Okay. Okay, so then uh, here, let's actually check. If I do A times the vector Cx, 
Okay, well, uh, C is just a constant, just a scalar, right? So matrix vector multiplication does have the property that I can just pull the scalar out to the front of everything. And then since x was in the null space, this would be c times 0. <coughs> so that's because of um, our assumption on x. So we do get that a times cx equals 0. Therefore, this scalar multiple is in the null space. And that shows that it is closed under scalar multiplication, all right? So that's sort of like a proof, if you will, that the null space of a matrix is indeed a subspace. So the terminology is sort of like justified, if you will, all right? <coughs> so that's what, we're, that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to get to? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's what I was trying to show right now. So, you know, you guys have had to check if something is a subspace or not before. So this is just like another one of those types of problems, a little bit more abstract, but kind of similar in principle. Okay. Can we use this, like, if we need to check to see if mm -hmm. vectors are part of a plane or if they're part of a... I think this itself wouldn't help with that kind of question. Uh, this is me just sort of practicing you know, verifying closure under addition, closure under scalar multiplication, uh, just because uh, I think that's something that you guys need to know. All right. But in, this, in the sense, like, this wasn't really, like, part of a problem or example, if you will. Just something I wanted to show you guys. All right. Uh, you should be able to make kind of similar types of arguments because uh, you'll be asked to show that something is a suspect or not. Any other questions? Okay, so let's actually do some examples of finding the null space of a matrix. You guys actually already know how to do this, if you will, okay? So remember, null space was just a set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation. So finding the null space amounts to finding the solutions to this equation. So let's do some examples. Let's start with some like easier ones first. So here is uh, a matrix that I'm going to create. Let's say I want to find the null space of this matrix. <coughs> so to find the null space, we need to solve uh, AX equals 0. And so to do that, well, I mean, we'll just set up our augmented matrix, right? And we'll just kind of real reduce and do what we usually do. This was a really simple example. I can just do row 2 minus row 1, 0, 0, 0. OK. So then essentially, we have just one equation, right? I'm going to write it as 1x minus 1y equal to 0. So in other words, we just get the equation y equals x. Right? So in other words, the null space of our matrix is going to be this line, y equals x, all right? <coughs> OK. So that was a relatively simple example. <coughs> um, let's look at um, another example, all right? So I have another matrix, again, just trying to find the null space. <coughs> so just uh, set up the, whoops, set up the augmented matrix again, corresponding to the homogeneous equation. 
And again, I'm just going to roll reduce this and we'll see what I get, all right? Okay. What, you already checked the first one? That's what that graph is? Yeah. So the null space boiled down to <coughs> uh, anything satisfying this equation. So just give us the line y equals x. OK, so uh, here I'm going to do the row operations. So in this case, what would happen? We will get 4 minus 6 <coughs> is negative 2. And at this point, uh, it's upper triangular, so I can go ahead and write out the corresponding system of equations. And this time, what I get is y equals 0 and x equals 0. And that's it. OK? So in this case, there was only one solution namely uh, 0, 0. So that means that the null space in this example what consists of just the origin. So it's just that one point and nothing else, because that was the only solution. All right. Make sense? Uh, so let's do like, you know, a bigger, kind of more complicated example now. Mm. Okay. All right, here is our matrix. Okay, same question. We want to find the null space. <clears throat> All right. So it's the matrix is bigger, but it's not necessarily much more difficult. We just need to do a lot more row operations. So I'm going to set up the augmented matrix for the uh, homogeneous equation, so zeros on the right hand side, and we're just going to do the uh, row reduction, okay? Uh, so let's see here, I would do row 2 plus row 1 to eliminate the negative 1, I guess I would do row 4 minus 2 of row 1 to get rid of this 2, all right? So let's hope that we make no mistakes as we go along. Okay. So row three is unchanged, so I'm gonna copy that. Okay, so row two plus row one is one, negative one, positive one, zero. We do row 4 minus 2 of row 1, <coughs> so negative 2. 6 minus 4 is 2. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. Negative 1 plus 2, I think, is positive 1. Okay? <coughs> All right. So next, uh, I'm going to you know, get rid of these two guys. So I'd probably do row 3 minus row 2, and row 4 plus 2 of row 2. OK? <clears throat> so let's <coughs> do that next. Let's see here, row 1 is unchanged. Row 2 was unchanged. Okay. okay. So negative 1 minus negative 1 is 0. 
zero plus or zero minus one, right? So it would be negative one. One minus zero is one. Zero. Okay, negative three plus two is negative one. One plus zero is one. Okay, pretty good. <clears throat> All right, so uh, if we do row four minus row three, that would give us a row of zeros. Now at this point, um, we could go ahead and write out the system with equations, but uh, I'm going to do just a little bit more. This is not necessary, it's just uh, something that I personally like. Uh, I am going to reduce to the reduced row echelon form, all right? Meaning um, I also want to eliminate everything above my pivots. So right now, my pivots are here, here, and then right now, this is my next pivot. Okay. So I'm going to put it into reduced row echelon form. Again, not entirely necessary, uh, but I think it's uh, nice. I'm going to do that. So first things first is um, I'm just going to multiply row 3 by negative 1 just because I want to get positive 1 for a pivot, <coughs> especially if I want the reducible echelon form. <coughs> all right. So now I have uh, three pivots, and they're all equal to positive 1. So what I want to do to get it into the reducible echelon form is eliminate everything above my pivots. In this case, I would still want to eliminate this two and this one. All right. So to do that, I would take row one and minus two of row three this time. I'll also do row two minus row three. All right. Finally, let's see what that does. So row 2 minus row 3 will give me a positive 1 here. And then row 1 minus 2 of row 3, I think that's a positive 1 here as well. OK? And so then at this point, I have reduced my matrix A into that reduced row echelon form. And now I'm, yes. Oh, I'd say you do that. Uh, I will show you actually, or I'll mention it, okay? So at this point, I am now going to write out my system of equations. Uh, let's do from the first row 1x1 plus 2x3 plus 1x5 equals 0, okay? My first equation. In the second row, I have x2 minus x3 plus x5 is 0. And finally, in the third row, I have 1x4 <coughs> minus x5 equal to 0. Now remember that I am looking for the solutions uh, to this system of equations to get the null space. So if I wanted to write out the solutions, how would I do that? What would I do? Mm -hmm. 
So here we are in the situation where we do have infinitely many solutions. So I'll have uh, three equations, but only five unknowns. Or sorry, five unknowns, but only three equations. So I can only solve for three variables, and I should have two free variables. Okay? Which variables would we want to be free? Or would we choose to be free? X3 and X5. Yeah. If I go with the ones without a pivot, that would be X3 and X5. So, if I assign a parameter, s and t, for the three <coughs> variables, then I can write out the rest of my uh, solution in terms of the parameters. So, x4 is just equal to t, right? x2 would be s minus t. Finally, x1 would be negative 2s and minus t. Okay. So I'll make a comment now as for uh, why did I reduce to the reducible echelon form, all right? If you reduce it to the reducible echelon form, then this part is really easy. So basically, I just needed to move uh, x3 and x5 to the other side, and that was it. Yes. Can you uh -huh. scroll down just a little bit? So I scroll down or up? I, uh -huh. I need the, to go. I need the screen. Yeah. Just yeah, going up, right? Yeah. yeah. Let me actually. Uh, is that good? Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. So if I did not reduce to a real echelon form, what would have happened is maybe you would have solved for x4, and then you would have had to back substitute that and solve for like x2, and then back substitute all of that to solve for x1. So if I go all the way to REF, I don't need to do that back substitution. That's basically it. Okay. So do you like just do that, or do you do real echelon form until you mm -hmm. have two free variables? Or you could, yeah, you could just, uh, so you could have stopped, um, you know, like here. Uh, you have the two pre variables. You could have written out your equations and done it at this point. Uh, there would have been some extra back substitution that you would have had to do as all. Well. Okay? So, like, what I'm saying is, mm -hmm. when, when do you know, like, like do you just do one uh, reduced row echelon? Like, like, you just do that one, or do you do it until you know you have two free variables? Uh, I guess so, yeah, so to get reduced for echelon form, oh, whoa, okay. So the requirements are that your pivots are all positive one, and you should have zeros above and below. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, as long as you have something above a pivot, you should also eliminate those, basically, okay? All right. So then uh, S and T can be any real number, right? So what we can say for this example is that the null space of A, so it's uh, all vectors, the set of all vectors, um, x1 through x5, so these are vectors in R5. And it's a set of all vectors satisfying this, uh, these uh, series of uh, equations. And S and T, again, can be any real number. <clears throat> now, I am going to do something extra, though. So if I write out my solutions here, I'm going to write it out in a certain way. So. I'm going to write it in a way where I've sort of separated my parameters into two parts. 
So here I'm just going to read off the coefficients of s. So negative 2, 1, 1, 0, 0. Negative 2, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then I'm going to read off the coefficients of t, which are negative 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. So first, uh, you can kind of see this is the same thing, right? So x1 is negative 2s minus t, so the same as the first equation, and so forth, all right? So all I did was rewrite all of this, but <coughs> in a more like an a interesting format, okay? So first off, when I do this, uh, these vectors I end up with, These are your so-called uh, special solutions. Okay. Uh, they're special because they form a basis for the null space. So that's something that you guys will talk about, I think, next week, all right? Uh, but for now, you guys are just calling them special solutions, and you haven't learned why they are special yet, all right? Now, uh, if I write it in this form, you see a couple of things. So we see that the null space is basically all linear combinations of these two uh, vectors, these two special solutions, if you will. So you can kind of get at least like a visual, sort of, of what your null space looks like. In this example, the null space was a plane, plane because it's spanned by two vectors. So it forms a plane. It's a plane in R5 or five dimensions. Okay. So that wasn't super important, but it's nice you can get that kind of geometric interpretation from the final answer. Okay. Wait, how, how, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you say it's a plane, so <coughs> we just looked at it and saw there was a plane, like what? Yeah, just signal? because yeah, just because it's uh, spanned by these uh, two vectors, so two vectors will form a plane, no matter what dimension, if, if they're um, independent, of course. Oh, okay, so yeah, yeah. it's not like you were saying you had two different vectors and you determined if they were a plane? No, no yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have two vectors, they're not multiples of each other, so they're going to form a plane. In this case, the plane lives in five dimensions, because your vectors were in five dimensions. <coughs> yes? Uh, so can you go back up to the first uh, yep. row, row yes. operation? Right there. So like after you did the first row operation, where mm -hmm. you have that second uh, pivot where it's a one right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, what would you have done if that second pivot was zero? Mm -hmm. uh, then my next pivot would have. Well, I may have uh, swapped rows, I guess, actually instead, because I would have gotten a pivot okay. from one of the other okay. guys. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. All right, any other questions? Okay. Uh, there's maybe not that much time left for like another example. So I think I'm just gonna end the review at this point, all right? So any just last questions about anything? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I know we already did this already, but yeah. I would like to get it out of my head to sure. show how to determine it. Something is a, a set of equations as part of a line, a vector, or a real space. Like, not just visually, mm -hmm. let's just look at it. Like, mm -hmm. what is the practical way of determining mm -hmm. this is a plane or this is all real? Okay. So, you mean like, um, is that in the context of like uh, <coughs> finding the null space? No, and, it's part or just of the first like, exam. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah, it's just part of first exam. You had this set. You have these three different vectors determine if they are a part of, if it's a line.